So how ought Christians to relate to the society around them? That question is an important one. It's one that continually troubles believers. But in answering this question, we can have a tendency, can't we, um, to be outwardly, to be preoccupied with outward things, with external things. Can I attend this particular gathering? Should I watch this particular TV program? Can I work for this particular organization? Should I submit to this particular instruction from the state? Well, believers are faced with decisions and dilemmas of this sort on a daily basis. Increasingly so in our ever more godless culture. Without a doubt, there are pitfalls on either side. On the one hand, it's possible to retreat from unbelievers around us. To abandon our calling to be salt and light in a corrupt and dark world. Well, on the other hand, Jesus warned us that we can lose our saltiness. The very thing that makes us different from the world. We can allow us to squeeze it into its mould. Well, Christians can spend a lot of time trying to navigate how to live in a world that is increasingly hostile toward God. We need God's wisdom from above, don't we, as we navigate the many decisions, the many dilemmas that come our way. <clears throat> but our text this morning, in 1 John chapter 2, has something to say about this question. What God has to say through the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, it's not really what we might want to hear. In fact, John's words are rather shocking to our ears. They're not what we might call nuanced or sophisticated. And while they're not the only thing that the Bible has to say on this subject, I believe they bring us much needed clarity in a time of confusion. Well, John is probably writing as an old man, reaching the end of his time on earth. He's probably writing to churches in modern day Turkey. He writes from long experience of life in the world, But more importantly, he writes as an eyewitness. He writes as one who spent time with Jesus, whose words are breathed out by the Holy Spirit himself. And John couldn't be clearer in his message, friends. He gets to the heart of the issue. He cuts through the knot with a clear and simple message. Do not love the world. He couldn't be more black and white. As the church and the world are chalk and cheese, they're oil and water, They don't mix. The one is completely opposed to the other. And each demands our allegiance. But John gets to the heart of the matter. And I trust as we consider these verses together, the Holy Spirit will give us the the, the clarity of spiritual vision which John has here. Let's see three things. We'll see the danger of loving the world. We'll see John's description of the world. And we'll see finally the destiny of the world. So firstly, the danger of loving the world. In verse 15, we see a clear command. Do not love the world. It's clear and it's stark. We can't misunderstand him. Like any good parent, John's not afraid to be negative when his little children, as he calls them, are in danger. John has become known as the apostle of love because he's got so much to say about love. When he comes to describe God's love for sinners, it's as if his words just soar off the page. No one paints in brighter colours than John when it comes to to painting the the beautiful uh, glories of God's gospel. But he's not afraid to strike this note of warning because there are souls at stake. And John speaks clearly and forthrightly. But if we're to understand him, we have to understand the particular way he uses words. In particular, the way he uses the word the world. And it'll be helpful for us to think about what he doesn't mean. Well, firstly, he's not saying that that we ought to hate God's creation. Because John understands that God is the creator of the world. In chapter 1 of John's gospel, he tells us the the world was made through Jesus, the eternal word. And in verse 11, he tells us of John chapter 1, he tells us the world is Jesus' own world. When John records Jesus' teaching, he records those images that Jesus uses, drawn from nature and created things, light and water and vines. And he's not telling us that we're not to love God's creation. He's not telling us then that we're not to to love the good things of this world. Well, Jesus himself didn't isolate himself from those around him. His first miracle took place at a wedding party where he turned the water into wine so that the festivities could continue. 
The Pharisees could criticize him for his eating and drinking. Well, they were wrong to do that. There was nothing sinful. There's nothing excessive about Jesus' behavior. But this shows that Jesus didn't think it was wrong to enjoy times of celebration. John would heartily agree with the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4, where he says that for everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Well, John doesn't mean then that we're to be unconcerned about those who are around us. Because this is the same John who recorded possibly the most famous words in the Bible spoken by Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John chapter 3 verse 16. So John could hardly be forbidding us to do what, he, what Jesus praises God for doing himself. Much of 1 John is concerned with uh, exhorting believers to love their brothers. But we also know that John isn't concerned to try and keep this gospel message just for a select few. He's concerned for his readers. He proclaims this message, 1 John 1 verse 1, so that his readers might have fellowship with the believers and with God. Um, and he can go as far as saying in, in, in chapter 2, um, he can say uh, that Jesus is the, sacri- the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice, not just for the sins of some small group of Jewish believers, but for the whole world, that is for anyone from where, anywhere in the world who will call on Jesus for salvation. So we've seen what John cannot mean. Well, what does he mean when he talks about the world? Well, there's another use of the word world which we see in John's gospel, in John's letters. Well, the former UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, once gave a newspaper interview for which she received much criticism, where she described her department's desire to create a hostile environment for illegal migration into Britain, a hostile environment. And friends, when John talks about the world here, he's talking about the world as a hostile environment for Christians, as a place, um, as a place opposed to God. So I've pick out, picked out some references from 1 John. If we look at chapter 3, verse 1, we see the world as the place that does not know us. It doesn't know believers because it did not know him. And in 1 John 4, verse 4, John talks about the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So the world is a place which is governed by the evil one. In chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, it speaks three times um, about the believer overcoming the world. This is the world as an enemy. And in chapter 5, verse 19, we're told the whole world is in the power of the evil one. So I hope you're getting the picture here. John's not talking about planet Earth as the home for, um, as the home where we live. He's not talking about the good things of creation, but he's talking about fallen, sinful humanity. As Don Carson puts it in a, a lovely little book of daily Bible devotions called For the Love of God, he has one page in these verses which is extremely helpful, and he succinctly summarizes what John has to say about the word world. He says the world as is habitually the case in John and 1 John, is the moral order in rebellion against God. Well, friends, this is the world we are not to love. We're not to make friends with it. We're not to seek accommodation with it. We're not even to flirt with it. And we have a comprehensive command here. We're not to love the world or anything in the world. We're to see the big picture. We're to see that the parts of the world are still part of the world. They're cogs in the same machine. They're fruit of the same poison tree. John commands his flock here. If we could hear his voice, we might hear him pleading with them to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. There's too much at stake. For he gives us a contrast here. A contrast because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because John is warning his readers He's warning you, he's warning, he's warning me that love for the world will destroy our souls. He's saying the same thing that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and be devoted to the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. As James tells us, friendship with the world is enmity with God. 
And notice, friends, that John doesn't say that if you keep yourselves clear from the world, you'll earn the right to God's love. Such a thing's impossible. For we're all bound up in love for ourselves, love for our, for our sin from our earliest days. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. Friends, please pay attention to this warning. Don't delude yourself. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. But yet the flip side of that is also true. Because if we no longer love the world, well, that can only be because the Father's love has been at work in us. John's speaking here of the Father's love for us rather than our love for the Father. God's love for us become, comes before our love um, our love for him. It takes the love of the Father to lift us up out of the mire and the dirt of our sins, uh, to place us on a rock. It takes the Father's great mercy to cause us to be born again into a living hope, to give us a new heart, new priorities, new desires and goals, so that we make it our aim to please him. Well, friends, which of these um, two characteristics describes you best this morning? What is it that makes you tick? Love for the world, things that will never love back, or is it the fact that you have been loved by God, by that undeserved, that all-surpassing love of the Father? He spared not his own Son, but gave him up for you. Well, let's see then the world described for us. Verse 15 has set out the command we must obey, that division which is always present between the world and God's people, even within the professing church, even within those who claim um, to know God. But verse 16 goes on to spell out what, what is meant by the world and anything in the world. And he gives us three aspects, three aspects of the world's appeal to us. He speaks of the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of possessions. And in doing so, John is bringing our minds back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, where Eve encountered the serpent where the serpent spoke to her and, and tempted her to disobey God's clear word. What, what was Eve's response? Well, she downplays God's word. She doubts it before she goes on to disregard it. And how did that temptation take root? Well, it took root through her eyes. Genesis 3, verse 6. Eve looked and saw the tree was good for food. It took, that temptation took root through the desires of her flesh, of her stomach. She saw the tree was good for food. She let her stomach rule her mind and her will. She gazed on the tree longingly. It was pleasing to the eye. It was also desirable for gaining wisdom. Genesis 3 verse 6. There you see John's three categories echo these three steps in Eve's downfall. And John takes us back to Eden, back to the garden, for a lesson because Satan, friends, still works in this same way today as he worked then. He still seeks to appeal to our desires of our flesh, to our bodily appetites. We could call that the enemy within. He appeals to our eyes and our senses to bombard us from temptation from the outside. We could call that an, his artillery bombardment. And he appeals to that pride which dwells in each of our hearts. So let's just briefly survey these different tactics, these different weak points and our defences, so that we might not be unaware of Satan's schemes. We see the flesh, firstly. Some versions might translate this, the cravings or the lusts of the flesh or the desires. Each of these words, in a different way, really helps to express the intensity of this longing, this overwhelming desire that demands that we act on it. These are desires of the flesh. They don't mean that they're desires for the flesh, they're desires from our flesh. Uh, the ESV uses the word flesh. The NIV helpfully interprets this as sinful nature. It helps us to understand what is meant. John isn't saying our bodies are the problem. He's saying our sinful nature is the problem. And friends, you don't need me to tell you that the problem with sin isn't a problem out there. It's a problem in here. Because what goes into a man's mouth doesn't defile him. But it's what comes out of their mouth that defiles them. The things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And it's these things that make a man unclean. Many believers throughout history have tried to deal with their sin by staying away from other sinners, maybe retreating to a monastery. Christians today might try something similar by keeping away from certain groups of unbelievers. 
Well, there might be certain wisdom, there might be wisdom in keeping our distance from the sources of temptation. But we can't escape sin by staying away from other sinners. Because sin comes from our heart. We still have our hearts to contend with. And everything that proceeds from our hearts is corrupt. And Satan works by stirring up those desires. Desires for things that are wrong in and of themselves. A desire for someone else to be harmed. But just as often he takes good desires and right desires and he twists them. He perverts them. He directs our desires down a forbidden path. He might take a desire for justice and turn that into vengeance. He might take a good desire to be married, to have a marriage partner, and turn that into selfish lust. And these things all spring from the fallen heart. And that's why, friends, that we need so desperately that new heart that God promises, a heart of flesh that will be tuned to obey God's law. We see the flesh and we see the eyes. The eyes, which are really the gatekeepers of the heart, as one author puts it, um, the main way that temptation from the world comes at us from the outside, especially today when each of us has, has a screen or many different little screens which we stare at carefully for hours each day. What we look at forms a very immediate impression on us. Look at Eve again. She saw the fruit of the tree was good. She took it and she ate it. That's the same thing that David did, isn't it? When he sinned with Bathsheba. He saw that she was beautiful and he took her. He followed the desire of his eye, the desire of his eyes. The gatekeepers were stood down. Sin was able to march in and take control of the city, as you like. And Jesus speaks so forcefully in the Sermon on the Mount about taking radical measures um, to root out sin. Because Jesus says there's no such thing as just looking, looking with lustful intent as sin. It's committing adultery in our hearts. Friends, don't be like Esau. We spoke about Esau with the children. A man governed by his eyes, governed by his senses, unable to think ahead. He wanted what he saw right in front of him. He couldn't properly value his inheritance as against a bowl of stew. We live in a society full of Esau's, do we not? Where people's attitudes, people's actions are governed by what they see. What they see in the shop window, what they see in the advertisements and social media feeds. Well, in a world that's battling for the attention of our eyes, friends, we need to fix our gaze on something more beautiful, more valuable. We need to fix our eyes by faith on Jesus. Because God's promise is that for the pure in heart, for those he has purified by his grace, well, we will see God. We've seen the flesh, we've seen the eyes, and we see here the pride in possessions as the ESV translates it. Um, or, or as the King James Version used to translate it, the pride of life. The pride of life, or I think as the NIV puts it, boasting in living, which is also helpful. Boasting in our manner of living. Boasting in the things that we have and the things that we've achieved. Because friends, we're not out of the woods, are we? When we think that we've dealt with obvious sins. Sexual immorality. Love of money. Love of alcohol. The sin is more subtle than we think. John's speaking here of the pride that sets itself up against God, that would even be God um, itself, uh, that, that would want us to be God ourselves. And that pride is what led to Eve's fall. It's what led to Adam's fall. It's what led to the fall of the whole human race. As Eve saw that that fruit was desirable for gaining wisdom, Satan's words appealed to her sense of her own status. It wasn't right. She felt that God should keep something back from her. She felt she had every right to be like God, just as Satan had promised her she would be. What she really wanted was not just to be like God, but to be God. Um, to know what only God is able to know. To be her own lawmaker. To be her own judge. To seek her own glory. That pride was her downfall. Pride comes before destruction. It came before destruction for Eve, for Adam. Adam. The same was true for Satan. Well, friends, we can be proud of our bank balances. We can be proud of our qualifications, our job title, our nationality. But it's also sobering to see just how many spiritually proud people Jesus had to deal with in his ministry. In fact, it was these religious types, some of them high up religious leaders, 
that opposed him most, in fact, who voted to condemn him to death because of their pride and their position. Because they realized if they were to follow Jesus, they would have to admit that they were no better, no better than the tax collectors, the publicans, the prostitutes who were coming into the kingdom. Oh, pride is a subtle danger, but it's a great danger, friends, and it lurks in each one of our hearts. Each one of us has this desire to be God ourselves, to make ourselves the center of the universe, so that everything and everyone ought to bow down before us. As King Nebuchadnezzar learned, we too need to learn that those who walk in pride, he that is God, is able to humble. Well, John describes the world for us here. The world that we're tempted to love. And it's not a pretty sight. And John warns us against a cynical view that says, well, that's just the way things are. Or God made me that way. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because the world and its desires are not from the Father. God created us good. He didn't create these desires in us. When we fall into sin, we can't blame God. We can't say God is tempting me. For God can't be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt anyone. Well, the world is not the way God created it to be. But let's look at what's in store for the world as we see finally the destiny of the world. The destiny of the world. And there's a stern warning here for those who love the world. The world and its desires are passing away. But there's also bright hope, eternal hope for those whom the Father loves. The man who does the will of the Father lives forever. The world and its desires are passing away. No wonder Jesus warns us in the Sermon on the Mount not to store up treasures in heaven. He's not against investment. But he wants us to invest in those things which will last. That will outlast the few short years we have on this earth. To store up treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. Where thieves cannot break in and steal. The world its desires are passing away. Well, the UK has recently mourned the loss of its longest serving head of state in in history. 70 years, 15 prime ministers. But despite the length of Queen Elizabeth's reign, her diligent service, the pomp and ceremony with which she was buried, her reign has come to an end. Death has intervened. Even for the, the most glorious, the most seemingly stable things in this world pass away. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. Death will come to each of us, whether sooner or later. And the world, that system of godless opposition to God, well, that will pass away too. As Peter warns us, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And friends, if the world is passing away, if the things we desire in the world are passing away, is it not utter folly to value our lives based on how uh, how many of these things we can acquire? Let me quote Don Carson once more, simply because he puts the point well. Pity the person whose self-identity and hope rest on transient things. Ten billion years into eternity, it will seem a little daft to puff yourself up over the car you now drive, the amount of money or education you received, the number of books you owned, the number of times you had your name in the headlines. The world and its desires are passing away. What a solemn warning. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Well, right now, hard-earned savings are being eroded by inflation Health can be taken from us without warning. But there's a treasure we can be sure that will last. That inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for us. Because the man who does the will of God endures forever. Who can John possibly be speaking of here? Who is there who truly does God's will? Who can measure up to that standard? Well, praise God, there is one who did. There is one who does measure up. Because as well as having Genesis 3 in mind, I believe, friends, that John also has Matthew chapter 4 in mind as he writes these verses. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. For Jesus himself was tempted to love the world in these three ways. Not in a comfortable garden like Eve and Adam, but out in the desert with the wild beasts 
and hung, as he was hungry. As Satan suggested to him that he turn the stones into bread, that he satisfy the desires of his flesh by misusing his authority, that he receive all the kingdoms of the world that he could see, that he display his power by jumping from the temple to be rescued by the angels, appealing to his pride. How would Jesus respond to these temptations? Well, praise God, unlike Eve, unlike Adam, Jesus, the second Adam, didn't give in. Praise the Lord that Jesus took our nature, that he overcame Satan and the world. He was pure in himself. There was no corruption for temptation to latch on to. His gaze was only on doing the Father's will. And he didn't seek out his own glory. He glorified his Father by humbling himself to death that the Father might glorify him. Jesus, friends, is the one who does the Father's will. He's the only one who does the Father's will. But what John says here, what God says through him, is that if you obey his command to put your trust in him, if you're united to him by saving faith, faith that works itself out in obedient service, well then you too can live forever with him. Long after the greatest sports stars, musicians or academics or presidents have been forgotten, their memories blown away like chaff in the wind, you'll be like the tree planted by the water which bears its fruit in its season. So friends, if you'll obey him by turning from your sinful desires, turning away from looking on vain things, turning away from your sinful pride, then you too can know this love of the Father in you, this eternal life that Jesus has earned by his perfect life, by his sin-bearing death, can be yours. And as he has overcome the world, you can overcome the world through him, through faith in him. So friends, let us receive him while we can and leave those desires of the world behind. Amen.